Today many people talk about the lack of time. They don't have time for anything. But yet we have so many opportunities in many in ways to maximize the time we have for things. We have smartphones, we have computers, we can send emails quickly through Messenger. And yet we seldom take time to think about our Creator, where we came from, and how we can unite ourselves in prayer to Him. And often when it comes to Sunday, we want to have a drive-through experience. We drive through the window, receive a blessing, and then continue on with our life. That's like fast food. It keeps us nourished for a little bit, but it really doesn't fill us up. Our souls are meant for the Lord, and they yearn and they crave for that opportunity to be with the Lord. Sometimes we think that uh, the divine liturgy of the Byzantine churches is very long and maybe not even uh, understandable for the modern world today. Yet we're always looking for nostalgia. We're looking for something that's retro. Uh, our liturgy is a very profound and deep liturgy. And in a sense, we ask people to leave all of their cares and their worries aside at the door of the church and to spend time with the Lord in prayer, in meditation, in giving glory to Him, and then to re-enter into the world refreshed and renewed. We often spend many hours in lineups to purchase tickets to go to different concerts. We'll line up for hours, even overnight, to buy the newest technical um, smartphones or whatever, because it's important for us. We have to understand, too, that the importance of communicating and being together. People say, well, Bishop, I can pray at home. And I certainly encourage people to pray at home. It's an important thing to have private prayer, individual prayer, but also to gather together as a community, a community of love. Jesus said, wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, I'm there too. I know that uh, when I haven't seen a friend of mine for some time, I'm happy to be with that friend. I want to spend time with that friend, to talk to that friend, to be with that friend, to find out how they have been, and they want to find out how I have been. The same is when we come together as a community of believers. The Byzantine liturgy has three parts. The liturgy of preparation, called proscomedia, which is the rite of preparation of the gifts, the bread and the wine, for the Eucharist. The liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is also called liturgy of the faithful. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is the living word of God. During the liturgy of the word, the Christian gospels and apostolic writings are meditated upon and proclaimed. At the liturgy of the Eucharist, faithful Christians participate in the self-offering of Christ to the Father, accomplished once and for all upon the cross by the power of the Holy Spirit. The liturgy of the Eucharist is composed of cherubic hymn, great entrance, litanies, the creed, anaphor, hymn to the Blessed Virgin, the Lord's Prayer, Holy Communion, prayer behind the emblem, final blessing. The second part of the Divine Liturgy is called the Liturgy of the Eucharist. It begins with the Cherubic Hymn. Before the assembly starts singing the Cherubic Hymn, the priest opens the Eleton, a linen cloth similar to the Western corporal. When it is folded, the Gospel book is laid on top of it. In the Byzantine tradition, it symbolizes the sudarium, or the face cloth, that was put over Jesus' face in the tomb. The gesture of opening the eileton represents the beginning of the preparation for the Last Supper, for which a decent cloth is needed.
While the assembly is singing, the priest says silently the profound words of this prayer. No one who is bound by carnal desires and pleasures is worthy to come to you, to approach you, or to minister to you, the King of glory. For to minister to you is great and awesome, even to the heavenly powers themselves. The main idea of this hymn is that the faithful take part in the same liturgy can celebrated by the angels in the heaven. In this way the cherubic hymn reminds us of the celestial liturgy described by Saint John in the book of Revelation. People on earth unite themselves with the angels in worship and all together, people and angels, receive the King of Glory. While the cherubic hymn is sung, the bread and wine are carried in solemn procession to the altar. This procession is called the Great Entrance. During the great entrance, the celebrants mention the hierarchy, starting with the Pope, the Patriarch, the local bishop, other clergy, and present faithful. Since the time of the Byzantine Empire, the Great Entrance has had two interpretations. According to the first one, this procession symbolizes Jesus' entry into Jerusalem before his passion, death, and resurrection. The second interpretation explains the Great Entrance as the funeral procession of Jesus after his crucifixion. After the great entrance is completed and the bread and wine have been placed upon the altar, once again a litany is chanted and a prayer is said in which the priest beseeches God that he would be merciful and would accept his people and their offering. During the creed that follows, the concelebrating clergy exchange the kiss of peace. The kiss of peace is not only a symbol, but the act of reconciliation between people. During the creed, the priests hold the veil above the gifts and wave it slowly, indicating the activity of the Holy Spirit. When the bishop is serving the liturgy, the concelebrating priests hold the veil during the creed as the bishop bows his head underneath it.
After the creed follows the anaphora, which is the culmination of the divine liturgy. The anaphora has two main parts. The first part is called the anamnesis. In Greek, this word means remembrance or commemoration. In the Byzantine liturgy, this is a prayer in which we actively commemorate the act of salvation accomplished by Christ. We thank our Lord for the prayer and the gifts He accepts at our hands. Though there stand by Him thousands of archangels and hosts of angels, the cherubim and the seraphim. The culmination of this part are the words of institution of the Eucharist. The second part of the anaphora is the epiclesis, which in ancient Greek means invocation. In the Byzantine liturgy, the Church prays to God to send His Holy Spirit upon the gifts, the bread and wine, so that they may become truly the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. After the anaphora, the faithful, remembering Christ, remember all people and all things in Him, especially Christ's mother and all of the saints.
Communion is preceded by a litany and by the Lord's Prayer as preparation for the faithful. Before the communion, one piece of the sanctified bread is put into the chalice with a cup of hot water which symbolizes the living character of the risen Christ, whose body and soul are reunited and filled with the Holy Spirit in the glorified life of the Kingdom of God. The faithful receive Holy Communion on a spoon. They are given both the consecrated bread and wine. In the Eucharistic celebration, we relive the mystery of the cross. We not only remember, but we commemorate the redeeming sacrifice in which the Son of God completely loses himself so as to be received anew by the Father and thus find us again, we who are lost, together with all creatures. Each time we take part in the Holy Mass, the love of the crucified, and risen Christ is conveyed to us as food and drink so that we may follow him on the daily path in concrete service to our brothers and sisters. Pope Francis said these words before the recitation of the Angelus prayer on Sunday the 3rd of September this year. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Explaining the words of Jesus Holy Father reminded us that our Lord's way is the way of love and that there is no true love without self-sacrifice. Sacrifice is not something we like to think about today. Yet, families are asked to sacrifice so much to educate their children. In our service of matrimony, we put crowns on the bride and groom and these crowns are the crowns of martyrdom. They're meant to be your first fitting. And as you become one, one body, the husband sacrifices his own self to his wife and the wife to her husband. And in this way, we start a family and we sacrifice everything for our children. We work maybe at two jobs just so that they could have a university education. So sacrifice is something that I think the modern person understands perfectly well. But we can fast or we can diet. If we're dieting, it simply means that I'm restricting myself to certain foods because I want to have, yes, maybe better health and a better looking body. But when we fast, we not only give up certain foods, but we add a special spiritual dimension to that, and that's prayer. And that prayer is what sanctifies our fast for us and to draw us closer into that intimate community that we refer to as the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are there always with us to guide us. Our Lord Jesus said that they would send the Holy Spirit to be with us to the ends of time. And so when we cooperate with grace, that is the Holy Spirit leading us. And then even the greatest things that we feel we can't do, we can do. And that's the same with sacrifice. Sacrifice for our time. Sacrifice for one another. We could even say that sacrifice is a divine act of love.
A litany of thanksgiving is then sung to the Lord, and at the end the faithful receive the final blessing of the Divine Liturgy.